There are four books in the New Testament called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Gospel means good news. So the good news of Jesus Christ, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These claim to be firsthand accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus. It is believed, it is believed that Mark was written first and that Matthew and Luke had Mark in front of them when they wrote their gospels. They're called the synoptic gospels, breaking that word down because I'm a word geek. Sin, meaning with, optic, op optics, optical, one eye, seeing through a similar lens. John was off doing his own thing when he wrote his gospel. These four gospels do not agree with what Jesus's last words were. There are seven sayings attributed to Jesus from the cross. They, they are not in all four gospels. They are a combination of the four gospels altogether. Matthew and Mark have only one saying of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Luke has an additional three. John has an additional three. So that makes up the seven sayings, seven in total. Throughout Lent, we are going to go through the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. Last week we started, and I don't know if you, did I say this at the beginning? I was so tickled that when I called uh, or texted with Bobby who filled in last week, if you have a sermon on, my, uh, on forgive them for they know not what they do, pull it out. And she did. Praise the Lord. So here we, the sermon series continues. So that was, there's, there's a historical order. We don't know what order they were set in, but there's a traditional order and we're going to follow that. Last week was on forgiveness. Today is, today you will be with me in paradise. I want to start with a story. My grandmother was diagnosed with leukemia when she was 89 years old. She was traveling with my grandparents, with, no, with, with my parents down in Florida. They hadn't moved there yet. And she flew up with my mother to, to New York. And then my mother flew back down to Florida to then drive up with my dad. And it was going to take three days. At the time I had finished my Masters of Theology. I had did not have a call yet. I was depressed that I was back home living again, but in retrospect, absolutely grateful because I got to be there with my grandmother when she died. The last meal I remember sitting at table with her and I can't remember whether my mother was there or not. She might have eaten dinner and then gone back down to Florida the next day. But she said, you're going to need to call hospice so that you won't have to call the police when I die. Okay, grandma, why is that? Oh, because they need to know that you didn't kill me with a pickaxe. That was my grandma. Great sense of humor. She went downhill so quickly in those three days. I could not sleep in the same room with her. There were twin beds, but I couldn't do it. But I slept out in the living room so that I could hear her. And she would wake up in panics. The hospice nurse explained that her body was shutting down and her brain was waking her up saying, you're dying, wake up. So she would wake up in these panics and I would go in and get her water or just calm her and she would go back to bed. And I remember sitting in the living room, just praying. And I pulled out my Bible and I went through looking up every passage that I could think of that promised peace. And I imagined that I was paving a road for her that she might enter God's peace on these words. When the hospice nurses arrived, one said to us, she's not going to die until your mother gets here. And she was absolutely right. And then when my mother was there and the hospice nurses arrived again, they said to us, you're acting like she's going to die tomorrow. She's very strong. She could be here for weeks, just so you know, so you can prepare yourselves. And we said, okay. 
And we were sitting with a social worker who said, who asked, is she a woman of faith? And we said, yes. And he said, then you never know. People of faith do not cling so fiercely to this life. That afternoon, my sister came over with her husband and we went into the room where my grandmother was sleeping and she was on medication. So she wasn't really alert, but one, someone held one hand and someone held her hand on the other. And we prayed for her that she might go, that we didn't want her to suffer, that we loved her but it was okay for her to go. And, you know, please say hi to grandpa for us when you get there. A few hours later, my mother was giving her her medicine. She was on one side, I was on the other. And my grandmother opened her eyes wide and she hadn't opened her eyes in a couple of days. And she looked at my mother and slowly stopped breathing. It was one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. Today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus promised. One of the many gifts that Jesus has given us in faith is to release us from our fear of death. I have also been at the bedside of people who cling to life, a miserable existence and not able to communicate. I have sat there and prayed and wondered, why are they hanging on? Are they waiting for someone? Are they waiting for the word of forgiveness? Are they waiting to hear, I love you? Is there something that they didn't say? Or are they just afraid? I heard this story about a doctor back in the day when doctors made house calls. It wasn't that long ago, but I think this story had a horse and buggy in it. And he brought his dog along with him. And so he went into the man's house who was dying and he left his dog outside, tied the dog up outside. And the dog wanted to be where he was so you could hear him scratching on the door. And the man who was dying asked the doctor, what do you think death is going to be like? And just then the doctor heard the, the dog scratch at the door. And he said, my dog doesn't know what it's like in your house, but he wants to be here because his master is here. That's what I think death is like, or I don't know what it's gonna be like, but I believe that my master is going to be there and it's going to be okay. I love that image. We're not sure, but we trust our lives and the lives of our loved ones into the loving arms of a merciful God. Fear of death is natural. It, don't beat yourself up, up over it, but do deal with it. Part of the funeral liturgy that I choose to use has these words, live as those who go forth to die. Live an abundant life. Quoting Adam Hamilton, the word for, the Greek word for paradise is a transliteration of a Persian word Transliteration means that you just, you hear it and then you spell it in your own alphabet. And it means King's Garden. The King's Garden was a walled garden that was a place of profound beauty. Sometimes it included a menagerie, which means like a zoo, combined with beautiful gardens, trees, and water features. When someone was honored in ancient Persia, they were given privilege of enjoying the King's Garden. Our story begins in a garden, Genesis 2, with Adam and Eve in relationship with God, walking with the master. 
Is it any mistake that when Jesus rises, Mary finds him in the garden and mistakes him for a gardener? We are brought back to the garden. Paradise in the sovereign's garden breaks down the walls between us. Because of Jesus, we understand that we get to live in the peace and presence of God without fear. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Another question that this passage evokes is fairness, like mercy for that criminal hanging from the cross. And by the way, that, that desire for fairness is also something that we are born with. And anyone with a sibling knows how many times do you hear, it's not fair. You got more than I did. It's not fair. She sat in the front seat last time. God isn't fair. Think about it. Prodigal son, before the son can, can, can recite his practiced re repentance, the father comes running open arms ready to throw a party. There's a parable about workers where the, the manager, the landowner, the, the steward hires these people to work during the day for, for, for a wage and they're okay with it. And then continues to hire more workers through the day. And then at the end of the day, pays them all the same. And the workers at the beginning said, that's not fair. And the landowner says, who are you to begrudge me my generosity? The mercy of our Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And truth be told, we can all hang up, hang on that cross for something. Sometimes it's thinking that we're better than other people. And by the way, that Psalm that we read is part of the confession where it says I was a sinner in my mother's womb. Always, that, that always makes me pause. I don't like that. But what, what it just means is humans are humans. Folks are folks. We make mistakes. We are sinners. That's all it means. And we worship a merciful and loving and forgiving God. It is not our place to judge, simply put. Our place, our job is to emulate Christ, who as we read in Luke, hung out with sinners. He hung out with the ne'er-do-wells, the Hebrew school dropouts, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, you and me, he called them friends. Another gift of Jesus is this, the knowledge that the grace of mercy, the grace and mercy of God has no bounds. We are living in a time when COVID first hit. By the way, I was working with a group of pastors this past week and somebody who is new to ministry said, is it more stressful now than, than usual in ministry? I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is quite a time. When COVID first hit, I, we learned, I learned about anticipatory grief, which means that part of our brains have been spinning on the fact that people that we love can die. And I don't know that the spinning has fully stopped. We want it to stop. We're ready for this to be done, but there's still part of our brains that's spinning with that. And now, Ukraine, what is that going to mean for us? The fear that we are on the precipice of a world war. What sacrifices are ahead for us? How do we live with all of this spinning in faith? in faith, 
faith that is, is not afraid of death. We don't seek it. But we trust that we get to be with the master. Faith that seeks to make this life merciful, just, kind. Or in other words, not a living hell, but to bring life and love to all our relationships, look for some way each and every day to connect with somebody, to let them know that they are loved, that they are thought of, that they are prayed for. Something else that we can do is to try to find some way to support the people who are in Ukraine and the stories are absolutely heartbreaking. However you want to do that, you can support our missions in the Presbyterian Church. You can go to the PCUSA website to do that. We at Bible study the other day, someone looked it up that they're giving to Samaritan's Purse and they are there. I give to Doctors Without Borders and I just, they are there in Kiev with medical services. However, you, whatever you can do to seek and bring life and love into this world. We'll do the world good and we'll do you good. We are to live as those who go forth to die and to live wholeheartedly in the name of Jesus Christ, our savior. From whom some of his final words were mercy and love today you will be with me in paradise. May it be so, in Jesus' name, amen.